Welcome again to Physics 142 Online. I'd like to remind you the Lorentz force law that tells us the magnetic force produced by a magnetic field on a moving charge. And that is, the force is Q times the velocity vector crossed into the magnetic field vector, QV cross B. And we know that the magnitude, of course, is just QVB times the sine of the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field, and the direction is normal or perpendicular to the plane of the velocity vector and the magnetic field. And the right-hand rule would tell us that in this picture, shown on the slide, the force is into the page. And so, what I'd like to do now is talk about the force on a charged particle that's moving already in a plane perpendicular to a magnetic field. And we can see here by the Lorentz force law that that force QV cross B for a positive charge moving initially to the right is downward. And as soon as that particle begins to deflect, the force adjusts so that it's always perpendicular both to the field, which in this sketch is coming directly out of the page at us, and perpendicular to the direction of the velocity vector. So what we can see very easily is that these forces will always cause the particle to deflect downward and to the left. And if we had a region where there was a magnetic field that took up the entire page, the particle would trace out a circular path. And one of the things it will do in just a minute is analyze the nature of that circle. Let's look again at the same kind of picture, but now for a negative charge. A negative charge moving to the right would feel a force in the opposite direction to the positive charge. Initially, it would be upward, as the particle would deflect in the upward direction, then the field would acquire a component to the left, and it would continue to do that as the particle was deflected upward. And so again, a negative charge would trace out a circular path if it was in a region big enough uh, for that path to be completed. One of the things right away that we can see as a result of this is that the direction of the force is always perpendicular to the path. But secondly, and importantly, we can see that the magnetic force doesn't do any work on the charged particle. Now, how do we know that? Well, the net work done on a particle is equal to its change in kinetic energy. So that would, if, it, if it's going to have work done, then the velocity would have to change. But look at the nature of this force again. The force is always perpendicular to the velocity vector. So the acceleration will be in a direction perpendicular to the velocity, and that means the speed can't change. For there to be some change in speed, one component of the force would either have to be parallel to or anti-parallel to the velocity vector. And here, it never will be. So this acceleration that the particle encounters is kind of a special one. It doesn't change the magnitude of the velocity vector, but it does change the direction. And you might remember that this was exactly how we defined circular motion. Uniform circular motion is where the acceleration is always directed perpendicular to the path and the speed doesn't change. So, that's just saying the same thing right there. Magnetic force does not change the speed of the particle, but just the direction. So now let's move on to analyze this problem quantitatively. Here we have a positive charge moving initially upward in a region where the magnetic field, you can see the tail fins of the arrows, show that the magnetic field is pointing into the page. And so the force that the magnetic field imparts will be perpendicular to the path all the way around this closed circle. So let's use Newton's second law, and that will tell us what the radius of the orbit is. The force being QVB sine theta in magnitude, well we see here the special case where the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector are perpendicular to each other. So the sine of 90 is 1. Thus, the magnitude of the force is just QVB. We also know, because we'll have m times a on the right-hand side of Newton's second law, we know that in this special case where there's circular motion, the acceleration has the expression v squared over r. So let's plug in to both sides of Newton's second law. On the left, we'll plug in QVB for the force. On the right, we'll plug in a equals v squared over r. And when we do that, we can solve for the radius, because one of the factors of v will cancel out, and this radius is mv over qb. For historical reasons, it's named after a person. It's called the Larmor radius. 
but we might also uh, want to know not just the radius of the orbit, but the frequency. How many times per second will this particle undergo circular motion? And that's an easy enough thing to do because from our study of circular motion, we remember that the linear velocity v is equal to r times the angular velocity omega, sometimes called the angular frequency. So v equals r omega. We make that substitution in the equation in the blue box. And the r's, interestingly enough, cancel out and allow us to solve for the frequency omega. And again, for historical reasons, we call this the cyclotron frequency, because the very first particle accelerator uh, in which this principle was employed was the cyclotron built in the 1930s. And so what's interesting about this is that the cyclotron frequency depends on the magnitude of the charge and the mass and the magnetic field, but it doesn't depend on the radius. So lots of identical particles traveling at different radial distances from the center would have exactly the same frequency. And that has a special application in the construction of the cyclotron, as we'll talk about in class. One last thing that we can calculate would be the period of motion. What would be the time it takes for one complete orbit? And t, the period, is simply 2 pi over omega. So that has the value 2 pi m over qb. And now I'd like to use these equations for a very simple problem involving the motion of a proton. Here's the problem I'd like to work out. We're told that a proton with a specific kinetic energy of 2.5 million electron volts, enters a region with a uniform magnetic field 5.5 tesla perpendicular to its path. Find the radius of the proton's circular path. And so we're ultimately going to use the formula for the radius that says r, whoops, that says r is equal to mv over qb. In this equation, by the way, we're used to thinking that q, the charge, can be both positive and negative, and indeed it can. But in this equation, it hardly makes sense to talk about a negative radius. And so uh, the way that this equation was uh, derived, uh, we assumed that the charge was simply the magnitude of the particle's charge. So we would not put a negative sign in for any of the quantities in here, uh, least of all the charge. So we'd like to plug in for this to find the radius, but we don't know the particle's velocity. However, we do know it's kinetic energy. And kinetic energy, of course, we know is 1 half mv squared. And so we can solve for v, right? v squared then is 2 times the kinetic energy over the mass. And we really want the square root of that if we want the magnitude of the velocity. So how do we get? square root of 2k over m. Well, the proton mass, that's a well-known quantity. We can look that up. The mass of the proton is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And of course, the charge on the proton, well, that's just the same magnitude as the charge on the electron. And we give the symbol e for that, 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. All right, so those will eventually go into the equation, but we need to somehow uh, figure out the energy. And uh, the energy is given to us in electron volts, actually in million electron volts. And so the conversion factor that we will use when we have to plug into this equation is that one electron volt is 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. It's actually the same constant that comes from the charge on the electron. And so we'll use that momentarily. Uh, so let's go ahead and calculate the velocity from this equation, and then we'll be able to plug it into the radius expression. So velocity, square root of 2 uh, times, we've got uh, 2.5 times 10 to the 6th electron volts. But then we need to convert that to joules. So we'll go ahead and use the conversion factor that there are 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 joules per electron volt. And so what this does, by using that conversion factor, the electron volts are going to cancel, and we'll end up with uh, an energy inside our equation that's just in joules. Then we need to divide by the proton mass. We know what that is, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And of course, this entire expression is underneath the square root. So 
we'll end up with the correct units. The electron volt units will cancel, and so we'll have joules over kilograms, which turns out to be meters squared per second squared, and when we take the square root, we'll get a velocity in the correct units. So it turns out to be 2.19 times 10 to the seventh meters per second, and this proton's moving pretty fast. Well, now we're ready to substitute directly into the radius equation. The radius then is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms multiply by the speed 2.19 times 10 to the seventh meters per second and we're dividing by the product of the charge in the magnetic field so we've got 1.6 0 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs and remember that the international system unit for magnetic field is indeed Tesla and so that'll turn out to be 5.5 Tesla and when we substitute in for what a Tesla is we'll see that the units for this expression work out to be as they should be for radius they work out to be meters so when the smoke clears we get 4.2 times 10 to the minus 2 meters which would be 4.2 centimeters. So that's how to very simply use the equations that we derived for the circular motion of a charged particle uh, to relate, in this case, the energy to the velocity, first of all, and then use the velocity to find the radius of the orbit. And I might mention that uh, in case this might seem to be of just limited application, uh, these are the kinds of equations that have to be used when we are designing uh, things like particle accelerators. We want to accelerate a particle like a proton, like the accelerator at Fermilab, that accelerates protons and their cousin antiprotons to very, very high speeds. We need to know, uh, in order for them to make it all the way around the ring of a certain radius, how strong of a magnetic field is it going to take. And so these very fundamental equations of physics actually find practical use in the way that we guide charged particles to form very energetic beams that can then be used to study the most fundamental properties of matter. I'll see you in class.